If you've been following the channel for a little while now, no doubt you'd know how the average Chinese person feels about the 19th century. For them, it's the century of humiliation. Having lost the opium wars to a newly industrialized Britain, and having watched Britain intentionally get their nation addicted to opium so that they could have Chinese tea, the Chinese wanted nothing to do with British missionaries. For a proud people who had long enjoyed the status as the world's most powerful empire, they were badly humiliated. But back in Britain, there was a man who had a similar disdain for what the British had done to the Chinese, yet he also firmly believed that Jesus was Lord over all, and not just Lord over Europe. And so going against the warning of his own nation, he scrapped the British suit for traditional Chinese dress, became a surgeon in many Chinese communities, and when he got physically beaten for being vocal about Jesus, he was adamant that the British do nothing in retaliation. This is the story of the missionary to the Middle Kingdom. This is the story of Hudson Taylor. Hello there. Okay, so this is an interesting video for me to make, mainly because it's a collision of both my China and church history series. If you're a subscriber for the China content, chances are you're predisposed to look at Hudson Taylor as a colonial oppressor. And if you're a subscriber for the church history content, chances are you're predisposed to view Hudson Taylor as quite a docile and gentle figure. I don't think either of those are true, and I hope that in this video you can understand my case. By the way, make sure to let me know below which series you watch more often, the church history or the modern China series. So Hudson Taylor was born in 1832 to Christian parents, but in his early teens he rebelled against them. Now you might not believe this, but in the late 1700s, a lesser percent of both the American and British population went to church than when this video is being made in 2022. And so for Hudson Taylor to abandon going to church wasn't quite the social scandal that we might assume it was. However, at the age of 17, Taylor came to faith after reading a story called Poor Richard. The fictional story centered around a coal miner who couldn't deal with the weight of his sin, but after two women shared this Bible verse with him, Richard felt the weight of his sin fall. The teenage Taylor resonated with this story and he came to faith in Jesus. Now, his father, James Taylor, was fascinated with China and not without reason. Though the dynastic hands had changed, it was an ancient empire still standing. Imagine if the Egyptians were still around today and your country was now making contact with the Pharaoh of all people. And so the newly converted Hudson Taylor, who'd grown up hearing fascinating stories about the Middle Kingdom, had a single mission, to share the same message that brought his soul such relief with the Chinese people. So the young boy began studying Mandarin along with Greek and Hebrew, and then in 1851, age 19, moved to a poor neighborhood in Hull to train as a medical assistant. In Hull, he practiced the discipline of relying upon the Lord and would often defer his wages to go without the comforts of life and to focus on prayer. Then in 1852, the Taiping Rebellion created a whole lot of interest in China, and as a result, the Chinese Evangelization Society was established and Hudson Taylor became its first missionary. And so leaving Liverpool in 1853, Taylor had a rough boat ride, but eventually arrived in Shanghai in 1854. At this point, Britain had only really expressed interest in the eastern coast of China because that's where trade was most valuable, and so with the support networks being there, that's where Hudson Taylor started. In his first few years, he ultimately made 18 preaching tours in and around Shanghai, and being a Brit, he was pretty poorly received wherever he went. However, while touring in and around Shanghai, he made a controversial call. He'd ditch the British suit and instead wear traditional Chinese dress, even donning a pigtail. Now, when he'd previously worn his dark overcoat, he'd been called the Black Devil, but his gesture was well received by the Chinese and the town started to be more receptive towards listening to him. Unfortunately for Taylor, many of his fellow Brits were viciously critical and basically suggested that he was overcompensating. However, for Hudson Taylor, the difference between evangelizing and colonizing was in the culture. Sure, the call to follow Jesus requires you to give up your old self to follow him and that may involve abandoning parts of your culture that directly violate his word. However, nowhere in the Bible will you find a verse that tells you what shirt to wear, what style of music to play, and all the other aspects of culture that aren't linked to morality. For Taylor, to require Chinese people to give up their entire culture to follow Jesus, even the bits that weren't breaking any biblical command, was to commit the grave error of adding to the gospel of Jesus. Taylor was also incredibly critical of many of his fellow missionaries, who for him were completely worldly. They didn't engage with local communities, offered nothing in terms of services like medicine, and spent way too much time with the British businessmen who had plundered China of all its resources. As for Taylor, he ventured further south, still facing opposition from the locals, as he was beaten, robbed, and had his medical supply cart burnt down. As he continued to oppose the other British missionaries, he ultimately resigned from the Chinese Evangelization Society, cutting himself off from money and resources to avoid association with who he described as worldly. But though Taylor lost resources, while further south in Ningbo, he met the woman who'd become his wife, Maria, 
and together they had a baby who sadly died in infancy, but then they had their first surviving child, Grace, in 1859. Now, in 1860, Taylor was forced to return to England for a poor health, but also as a way of having a short leave of absence from his mission work. But England was to prove no holiday for the 28-year-old. He translated the Bible from English into the local Ningbo dialect, completed a diploma of surgery, wrote a book called China's Spiritual Need and Claims, basically a call to be a fellow missionary in China, he toured British churches promoting mission work in China, and he even became friends with fellow insiders and exiles character, Charles Spurgeon. Not to mention that he and Maria also had a few more children in this period too. And so like I said before, Britain was mostly interested in controlling the east of China for its ports and resources, and had much less interest further inland. As a result, barely any missionaries had made it that far west of Shanghai, and so Hudson Taylor established a new mission society called the China Inland Mission and recruited 24 fellow missionaries, two for each of the 11 unreached inland provinces, and two for Mongolia. And so Taylor headed to the Middle Kingdom in 1866, and as soon as he returned, he was kept very busy. From a medical perspective, he was treating up to 200 patients daily, but as promised, Taylor and Maria headed southwest down the canal to a war-torn town called Hangzhou. Tragically, their first surviving child, Grace, died there of meningitis in 1867. From Hangzhou, the Taylors then led another party of missionaries north to Yangzhou, but they weren't exactly well received, their homestay being attacked, looted and burned in a riot. And this sparked international outrage with the British Navy even rocking up, and the British press criticised Taylor for nearly starting a war. And with this making the headlines that it did, there were calls from the British Parliament to withdraw all British missionaries. Taylor pleaded, saying that he never wanted any military intervention, and the missionaries were allowed to stay. I also think that this is an interesting event in showing the two mindsets in colonization. On the one hand, you had the more materialistic colonists who wanted Chinese resources, but cared little for the souls of the Chinese. But on the other hand, you had Taylor's missionaries, who, though a lot of you would disagree with, cared deeply for the souls of the Chinese, and certainly not for their riches. And the Taylors returned to Yongzhou, where Maria tragically died of cholera, a bacterial infection caused by bad sanitation. And this was yet another personal loss that Hudson Taylor endured in pursuit of the Chinese mission. However, as Taylor returned to Yongzhou for a second time, many started to convert to Christianity. And as the Chinese witnessed Taylor's personal suffering in pursuit of the cause, their perception of him as a self-absorbed, oppressive British enemy started to change. Taylor also remarried to another British missionary, Jenny Folding. Now, as the Inland China mission was growing and gaining a lot of traction, it'd be remiss of me not to discuss Hudson's leadership style. He was known as being a pretty intense personality, which, don't get me wrong, has both its benefits and drawbacks, but it really does seem like his disagreement with the Chinese Evangelization Society in the 1850s made him afraid to put any control of his new Inland Mission Society into other people's hands. As he himself said, China is not to be won for Christ by quiet, ease-loving men and women, but by those who put Chinese souls above everything, even their own lives. But as we hit the 1870s, Hudson Taylor started to receive some other pretty high-profile missionaries to come and help. For example, Charles Studd, who played for England in the first Ashes Test match, left his illustrious cricket career behind to join the Inland Mission. Six others joined Studd in a group that became called the Cambridge Seven, and this was important because in 1874, Taylor had a fall on a boat and for two years was paralyzed and incapacitated. By 1887, so fast forwarding another decade, the Chinese inland mission had grown to 102 missionaries and then in 1888, they welcomed 14 new missionaries from America. In terms of how many converts there were in China, we just don't know. However, the previous waves of missionaries were mostly Catholic and they didn't make it too far inland. Taylor's mission, however, was a strictly Protestant one that made it deep inland. And though we don't have the numbers of Chinese Christians, we do know that there were a fair amount killed in the Boxer Rebellion, a Chinese anti-foreign uprising. In 1900 alone, there were 189 Protestant missionaries and 500 Chinese Christians who were killed, 45 of which were killed in the Taiwan Massacre. Now, though this was decisive resistance against anything foreign, Taylor refused to accept payment for the loss of property or life. He came not to fight a war, but to lay his life down so that China would know the gospel of Jesus. And it would ultimately be in China where Taylor would die while reading in his inland home in Changsha in 1905. He was taken to be buried next to his wife Maria, and it really is an incredible story. Sure, Hudson Taylor was one of many missionaries in China, but at the same time he was the leader of the inland mission, and up until Hudson Taylor, British missionaries weren't that far from British businessmen who had plundered the Chinese land. Taylor was adamant that his mission would be the gospel of Jesus, and nothing more. Thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, make sure to hit the like button so that other people can see it when they search for Hudson Taylor, and make sure to answer in the comment section below 
Which series do you watch more, the Church History or the China series? We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.